Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Dan McCarthy. And I'm Brian Basaga. And welcome to the Functional Fighters Podcast. This is our podcast about martial arts as it relates to self-defense, practical applications, theory, history, applicability in the modern world. And as always, we're trying to make everyone a better martial artist. Absolutely. And in keeping with self-defense in the modern world, uh, Brian and I decided we would discuss today a little bit about uh, self-defense in, in in the current environment that we're dealing with. And to put context to that uh, statement, um, we record these on a weekly basis on a wen- Wednesday night. And the last time that uh, we were recording was actually the night that uh, the Washington, D.C. riots were going on in relationship to the uh, the state of uh, American politics in the presidential elections. So we decided, based on that fact, maybe we should talk a little bit about, hey, what's what happens in uh, in the real world uh, in when things are going down? What are your responsibilities and things like that? And uh, I think just even in general, if you look at 2020, uh, you know, and, and going back a little further than that, I feel like there's been more times of, um, I don't know what word I want to use, but let's say violence demonstration uh, in the last two years than I can remember in the rest of the time that I was paying attention to stuff like that. Right. Um, the I last think the time, term I would use is civil unrest. Uh, sure, that works. Yeah. Um, you know, the last time I can remember this scale of stuff, I think may have been in the '90s when there was a lot of the, uh, you know, uh, a, a lot of racial tension things going on in different parts of the country, and there were a lot of you know demonstrations and things that got uh, similar in, in nature to what we see now. Um, Rodney and, King sticks in my head. Rodney King was a big one, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and then there were several others, uh, you know, that popped up around that time as well. Ah. Um, and, and our uh, there's a couple things I'd like to say to the audience out there. Our discussion tonight will not be about whether these things are justified or legal or whether we agree with them or not. That's That's not what we're here to talk about. What we're here to talk about is how um martial arts how we can apply our martial arts knowledge in these times right Right. um we're not lawyers right we are not lawyers we're not politicians we're not psychologists or anything we're not uh smart enough to really tell anyone what they should be doing or thinking um we're just here to talk about martial arts um so with that i will just add one thing that that uh i will say um I think people need to hear. And that is generally my experience has been that martial arts transcends a lot of things, right? Um, In the 20 years I've been training in the martial arts, um, I have seen every uh, political viewpoint represented by a student. Um, I've seen uh, almost every ethnic background represented in the classes uh, that I've taken. Um, every major religion, including, you know, people who don't believe in religion, um, it has always been a place where I have found people to come together and not care about the things that make them different and focus on the things that, uh, they have in common, um, find some common ground and, and work together on improving their enjoyment and improving their skill and their ability and their understanding of that common ground. And uh, so, so so I would say the first best thing we can do as martial artists in the political and social climate we're in today is extend that attitude of inclusiveness and commonality to every other aspect of our life, every chance that we get. And uh, if we can do that, that maybe these types of times won't last for very much longer. I really like how you put that, Brian. That's, that's, that's huge. I mean, um, I, I don't disagree with anything you just said. I feel like overall, um, the martial arts I've experienced now, keep in mind, I'm, I'm a kid, uh, someone who was bullied as a kid, um, and kind of, you know, picked on and pushed around and not 
socially accepted in many ways. And the dojo was always the place I could go and I could feel like I was part of a group. That was, that was my group where I felt accepted and, and, and all of that. And it was okay for me to be myself. So, um, yeah, that's a very much a true statement. And, um, my general viewpoint towards most people in the world is that for the most part, I, I, I like people as a general rule. I, I, I think people are cool. Um, uh, and I'm like different types of people, I like people who are diverse. Um, my, my own personal peer group is extremely diverse in terms of the people that, uh, you could meet. And if you met me with one or two of my friends and then met me with one or two of my completely different friends, you might be very surprised that I'm friends with both both of those groups of people. Um, and yet I'm capable of being so because for the most part, it is, I like to treat people with dignity and respect. And unless you're, unless you are like outright mean to me and, and disrespectful towards me, I'm probably going to be very open and very, very cool with you, regardless of what your viewpoint is on things. Um, on any topic, because I'm, I'm really okay with people having different ideas, different thoughts, different opinions. And, and I feel like if you come at me with a different opinion, as long as we can have a discussion about it, that is based on dignity and respect, then maybe I can learn something and maybe you can learn something by having a conversation. So yeah, I, I agree totally with what you just said. Yeah. Thank you. I, um, you know, I was discussing this with, with, uh, my wife, uh, I can't remember how long ago now, within the last several days anyway, and you know, the, the, the observation I made at the time, I think people are good at uh, finding their, their tribe, right? This is a common term that you hear, right? Find the people that you get, you know, you have some common ground with and find a group that, where you feel like you belong. And, yeah. And there's a number of forums, particularly with social media and all this stuff where it's, you know, it's relatively easy to do that. I think the problem is that we've kind of lost the recognition that even if someone isn't in our tribe, they have the same, um, they're still humans, right? Yeah. They have the same value um, to someone else as someone in our tribe has to us, right? And yeah. in that human condition we still share even if we don't agree and um, you know, and, and there's not uh, th there's not a politician who is going to teach us that again, the, the, we, we saw that in spades in this last election cycle. Um, they are just doubling down on you're with us or you're against us. And uh, you know, you can vote for, the reds or you can vote for the blues you're getting the same attitude right yeah. um it's it's it things changed uh, the government changed in in this election in the u.s and uh, things will not get better because the rhetoric is continuing so it's going to be on us guys it's going to mm -hmm. be on on us regular people to kind of take back control of how we want things to do and yeah I'm sorry, but but my opinion on the on on the political parties at this point in time is the Republicans and the Democrats might as well be the the Crips and the Bloods. They really might as well be. Um, I'm sorry, but <laughs> yeah. that's that's my opinion of it because you're 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 either in one gang or you're in the other gang, and you better be in one of them if, because if you're not with us, you're against us. Um, and that's such you know reductive thinking and. and you know, I don't really care for that kind of thinking in, e in either direction. I, I prefer a more moderate type of thinking and the ability to stop, shut up, which is hard for me to do, but take a moment where you can be quiet and you can listen to the person on the other side of the aisle, try to hear what it is that they're saying and try to actually comprehend what's being said to you and think about it as opposed to just being ready to throw your next um idea that shoots it down um and why your why your idea or why your philosophy or why your methodology is better because it is right um shut yeah. up and listen for a while yeah it's um i think as as uh as we're moving through the social media um you know era of the internet i think the, the psychology is is really showing us that that type of attitude is 
is a side effect of social media where yep. there are all conversations are one sided, right? It's like you're yep. posting and I'm posting and we're talking, but we're not really conversing mm -hmm. because I say what I want as a declarative fact, and then you say something else, and then I say a rebuttal. And even if we're agreeing, I think how the our brain is interpreting that conversation, right? There is no learn, uh, you know, open your mind, learn, understand, revise your opinion potentially, you know, and, and progress. It's just social media is ruining our ability to do that. Well, I wonder uh, if we're going to find from a psychological standpoint, you know, if, if when you and I are senior citizens, um, uh, the two of us, and we're looking at like our grandkids or our great grandkids, that there's going to be this very definitive statement, this very definitive statement that social media is actually just like drugs, alcohol. Um, that it is, it is in fact something that's fairly cancerous, something that's fairly poisonous to the human condition. Uh, but just like a lot of other substances, mm -hmm. there's a regulatory type of a situation because obviously people still drink, people still smoke. Um, we've we've known for how long that cigarettes cause cancer, and yet we still allow it to be a legal thing that that people do. We let people kill themselves with uh, with cigarettes. Right. And even more importantly, we let people kill the people next to them. With cigarettes. <laughs> right. um, yes, if you want to be so. an idiot and do it, that's your business. But you're also polluting the air of everybody around you. So big thing when we were kids right there. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, yeah. And anti smoking campaigns and yeah. still not as prevalent, but hasn't gone away. And social media won't go away. And the, the research is already starting to come out on that. It's called dopamine addiction. Yep. Is, Absolutely. Is really what it's causing, right? You get, Absolutely. Uh, Little hits Ooh. of uh, somebody likes my post. Somebody right? likes me. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Total and dopamine. Uh, and yep. it does. It does make you an addict, and yeah, you do struggle with it if you find yourself, uh, you know, looking at your phone compulsively, like without even thinking about it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, oh, what have I been doing for the last two minutes? I was looking at my phone, and what you know, how long imagine, has it been since the last time I looked at my phone? That means you're becoming a dopamine addict. Imagine so. our our children's generation. Not even the the generation of kids that like you and I know who are already adults. Imagine your daughter and my my boys, what they're gonna have to contend with, and that's something that as parents mm -hmm. we gotta we gotta watch. Anyway, though, um, yes, here's so. here's here's something I wanted to talk about in terms of the, the the current environment of things and and stuff that I try to keep in mind because I I had a class last night with my my self defense group and I talked about the impending. Uh, inauguration of Joe Biden. And I was talking to my students about the simple fact that they should be a little bit more um, in it for the, the next week and paying attention to what's going on around them for the next, you know, uh, 10, 10 days or so, what's happening around you. Cause you never know what's, what somebody is going to snap or, or do. And we just had riots in DC. There's no reason why there won't be something in, you know, other state capitals. There's no reason why it won't happen in other major metropolitan areas. And somebody just decides that they're going to jump on the bandwagon and they're going to, they're going to, you know, raise some hell, you know, in favor of their preferred candidate or whatever. Um, and so we talked in a previous episode about the Cooper code and we talked about PETA loop and things like that. And so what I told my own students, because this is all vernacular, it's all jargon that they know. I told everybody says, you can't be in yellow right now. You need to be walking around in orange. You need to just heighten your awareness just a little bit more and pay attention to what's going on around you because there are, are people who are legitimately angry on right. both sides, on both sides. Right. I've, I've heard that referred to before as hot yellow, right? You're not, hot uh, yellow. yeah, you're, uh, you're just, you know, you're on the borderline, right? You're, uh, you're taking it up a notch without, yeah. uh, you know, actively, uh, yeah. you know, creating a scenario in your head to evaluate. Right. So, yeah. And that's probably the first place that martial arts really plays into this is because we we do situations where we talk about scenarios and we talk about the psychology of things and we give you these things. This is probably the, the first place that martial arts actually ties into the current political environment is that you, it should be giving you a higher state of awareness than maybe maybe most people have of what, what could potentially go on. Yeah. 
So if the number one thing we can do with our martial arts training is, is spread that, um, the, the compassion and understanding that we get our, our ability to come together, uh, despite, you know, our differences. And the number two thing our martial arts training prepares us for in the situation is that awareness, right? Mm -hmm. Understanding mm -hmm. just how to be aware and that, you know, we've talked about it before. I wanted to spend just another minute talking about another aspect of awareness that, that we haven't, I don't think we've covered before. You know, we've, we've presented it before as, you know, what am I looking for? I, you know, behavioral cues, uh, people doing things, you know, that fit the, um, you know, uh, profile. It's profile. a bad word these days, but that really what it is, right? Fits the mold of someone who's about to do something violent mm -hmm. or something I don't want to be a part of, even if it's not violent, right? And then I can get out of the way. Uh, another way that, you know, we want to talk about awareness is um, just general things like situational awareness, right? Like, um, for instance, you mentioned, what if there's a demonstration at the courthouse or something like that, right? Or the government building? Well, you know, this is the time of year when I have to go in every year to our uh, county building and sign a little paper that says I still live in my house and I still qualify for a personal property tax uh, code thing that our state law has not, and I know, you know, I don't have to pay a higher tax bill, right? Mm. So when I go into that courthouse, what am I going to be looking at? I'm going to be looking at every door that says exit above it whether it says emergency exit or not right it's like i'm going to go in there and it's not a familiar surrounding to me i don't know how i know how to go out the way i came back in but this is a good time to like go to that hot yellow like we said before right and say all right i see if i can get to the other end of the building there's a fire exit or if i can go through here there's a door that says exit on it, and i'll just i'll go out there and figure out what's next or whatever right because if everybody's out front getting uh restless you know i don't want to go that way back to my car um little things like that you stay at a hotel do you ever pay attention you know there's a thing on the back of the door that tells you like how to get out of your room if you can't use the elevator shows you mm -hmm. where the stairwells are have you ever mm -hmm. read it <laughs> right do you yeah. know where your emergency exits are i can i can tell you one time in my life it because i used to travel a lot for work and i always you know, I always looked at that stuff because I had been a martial artist for a lot of years by then. And I was on the awareness train and there was actually one time when, uh, this was, I was my wife was taking a training class in uh, Kentucky down at, uh, I'm blanking out in the university right now, but in Lexington, Kentucky, she was down there staying in a hotel, taking a, like a two week long training class thing. And we went down to visit her one weekend. And we're sitting in her uh, extended stay type hotel room thing and the fire alarm went off mm. and it was just like, Oh, where do we go? We're on the third floor. How do we, you know, and she's like, we, oh, we can't use the elevator. How are we going to get down from here? I'm like, you go this the way. Stairs are out the door to, to you know, we're going to go out our door, turn left. Two doors is the stairs. That's how we're going to yeah. go. You how do you know go. that? Well, I read the sign on the back of the door when I came in, you know, yeah. it, it's like it, it you never know. It's like the Boy Scout thing, right? It's prepared. Prepared. Yep. Ninety nine point nine percent of the time, you don't need it, but right. that time that you do, it's good to have it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what you were saying about uh, about the the courthouse, uh, one of the things that I keyed into listening to you talk, just at another point, a place like that is going to have law enforcement. Um, so if you're a law abiding citizen on the right side of the law, you still should know where the law enforcement officers are in a situation like that so that you stay out of their way. Okay. That's mm -hmm. a really, really, really important thing to keep in mind. Um, even as a martial artist, I'm, I'm a martial arts instructor. I've done some time as a bouncer in a bar. I have no business getting involved in a situation that law enforcement officers are are dealing with on a professional level the only thing i'm going to do is going to be a detriment to them doing their job because they don't know me so for all they know i am actually part of the problem and that gives them another problem that they have to deal with another variable so yes, if i right. if, if you want law enforcement officers to be able to do their job to the best of their ability stay the hell out of their way Okay, you're not going to help. You're going to actually make them a lot more nervous. Let's um, do a let's do a show on when to intervene and when not. Yeah, 
That's a good idea. Yeah. Right. So, so let's just say uh, under Brian's scenario, you happen to be at the courthouse and then all of a sudden there is a riot out front. You need to stay out of the way of the law enforcement officers while at the same time heading towards an exit that is nowhere near whatever is going on. You need to create space between the situation and yourself. If you're a law-abiding citizen, stay out of it, okay? Because you're not going to do anybody any favors by getting involved in it. You're just going to make it a bigger kerfuffle, okay? Um, Now, when it comes to legality and and all that kind of stuff, you know, Brian and I, we're um, we're not lawyers, we're not judges uh we're not policy makers um so the the best thing that i can tell you when it comes to legality is know your own laws okay i live in omaha nebraska what i need to be concerned about when it comes to self-defense for the most part on a daily basis is i need to know federal uh uh, statutes and to a certain degree because they apply everywhere in the united states um i know state statutes uh and i might need to know some that uh uh, go specific to the municipality i live in uh, of omaha douglas county so on so forth okay uh i don't spend a lot of time anywhere else although i am omaha is right on the border of nebraska and iowa so it's not a bad idea for me to have an idea of some iowa state statutes as well because i'm i'm 20 minutes away from iowa um and very often if i have to travel iowa is one of those places i will spend a lot of time on because i'm on the far side of it so if i am going east for any reason i will cross all of iowa um so it's a really good idea for you to know some of these things Um, especially because regardless of where you are, and this is pretty much a universal principle across the world, if you are somewhere, then you are going to be under uh, the the legal precedence of where it is you are, the law of the land. It doesn't matter whom uh, you owe allegiance or citizenship to. Um, If you are somewhere else, Uh, You are subject to those rules and you're going to be tried and punished by those rules. And this kind of stuff happens when you leave the country and you do something stupid that is against a law that you don't know exists in some foreign country. And then the next thing you know, the U.S. Embassy is trying to get involved in order to help you out. But until such time as they can do that, you're kind of screwed. Yeah, and they may not. (laughs) I mean, that's the other thing to consider. They may not. So, yeah, definitely, you know, the legality of self-defense is something else that you should. You should be getting at an appropriate level in your training right Mm -hmm. now. You know, you you and I and I I just know this because we've trained together for so long. We both do talk about the legality of self-defense and levels of force and all that. But we're not lawyers. Right. So we, we speak more in generalities, obviously, um, and and with an abundance of caution, right? I mean, I, mm-hmm. we counsel our students to use an abundance of caution to, you know, when making their decisions about how or if they're going to respond to a situation. Now, if someone's swinging crazy punches and, you know, you don't, you know, you're going to have to do what you have to do to survive, right? The, the, the um, thing that does not get out of the way, like you said, is, is the law of the land, right? You, yeah. you will decide to survive and then you will face and then whatever you deal consequences with it. may come with how you chose to survive or what you had mm-hmm. to do to survive, right? Or mm-hmm. how you misread the situation or, you know, a million things can go wrong in the justice system. The, yep. the you know, the, the, the truth uh, or the, there is some truth to the old saying that it should be called the injustice system. Right. Well, because, and and what's what's that old saying? The 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 man who acts as his own representation is a fool for a client. Something <laughs> yes, something I've heard something that like that. Yeah. Right. Uh, so keep in mind if you find yourself in a in a self defense situation, how you represent yourself starts the moment you speak to a law enforcement officer. Okay, it's not in the courtroom. It starts the moment that you have interaction with with an agent of the law. So. Mm-hmm. If you do put yourself into, or let me rephrase that, if you find yourself, maybe not put yourself, but if you find yourself in into a circumstance that requires self-defense, um, you are going to have to understand that you're going to have to answer to somebody more than likely. Um, 
and the person who should advocate for you is your attorney. Okay. Don't advocate for yourself because unless you are an attorney, you don't know enough about the law. I don't know enough about the law to say the right thing in front of a law enforcement officer uh, if I was to defend myself. And I actually know quite a, a lot about the state statutes in, in Nebraska in terms of what can be done, what can't be done. But you're not going to hear me look at, uh, uh, you, you won't see a situation where I'm talking to a cop and I go, yeah, so I know I have a duty to retreat and I did my duty to retreat. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to look at the cop and go, listen, man, I know my rights. I, I, I really would like to speak to my attorney, please. I'll comply with whatever you need me to comply with. Um, I'm, I, I'll No problem. Uh, but I'd really like to to talk to my attorney because I don't really understand what I'm supposed to do here, and I'm kind of I'm kind of afraid. And I'm, I'd be very honest about that. You know, let, let me talk to my attorney because I want to get the right counseling on how I'm supposed to deal with this situation. And quite honestly, I'm I'm in shock and I'm kind of scared. Can I talk to my attorney, please? I'll do my best not to create any um, any problems for the law enforcement officers as best as I can and be as compliant as possible. But I also don't want to do something on accident that makes the situation worse for me. Yeah, sure. There's, there's a, you know, (sighs) for people who are listening, an interesting thing you could consider doing, you know, a, a lawyer, um, you know, I don't know what they charge, right? It depends a lot on how, good of a lawyer they think they are and what part of the country you're in, you know, but it's, uh, it's somewhere between, let's just say whatever, 200 and $500 an hour, right. For whatever it is that they do. So if you're a martial arts program with, you know, five or six students and you're all willing to pitch in $50, you could buy an hour of that lawyer's time for a Q and a session, right? Hey, we're martial artists. We're not looking for trouble. We may find ourselves in a self-defense situation at some point. What can you do, you know, to what, what, what can we do? What can you tell us? What knowledge can you give us to help us be prepared for how to deal with the after the scenario, right? The somebody just attacked me and I fought back and now what do I do? Right. And, uh, you know, they're the ones who are going to know all those local laws and statutes and the federal laws and how they interact and all that stuff. And, you know, that you could find that that would be uh, an hour of your time very well spent to understand, again, yeah. preparedness-wise, before you need to know it, right? I, I wonder if that could be a future guest subject with the <laughs> understanding that when we, if we were, were to do something like that, that attorney is only speaking within their own jurisdiction, uh, number one. So right. if 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 we grab an, uh, an an attorney who practices law in Omaha, Nebraska, they're talking about the state of Nebraska because that's where they're that's they, 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 they that's where they can practice law, right? Yep. right. Um, they're not talking about anything universal. Um, if they were a lawyer in Indiana, then same thing. They would be talking about within the the, the state that they actually have licensure to to practice, right? So you you can't. You can't take anything like that uh, and cross borders because it's meaningless at that point. Yeah, true. It's something we could consider. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, legality of self-defense is a good good topic to understand. Um, you know, and the big – the other thing I like to, to always talk about when I'm talking to my students about this is, like, you, you know – in our training, I think we do, you know, we do a pretty good job of understanding levels of force and appropriate responses and, um, and all of that stuff. But your enemy, your, your enemy is your anger, right? Because when mm-hmm. someone attacks you in the street, you're going to be scared, right? Mm-hmm. And, and as soon as you get a handle on the scared part, you're going to be really you're mad. Be angry. Yeah. And, and you know what? Afterwards, you're going to be even more mad, right? Because now you're thinking about all this stuff. Well, now the police are questioning me and I'm in handcuffs. And why am I in handcuffs? I was just walking home from the grocery store or whatever, you know, and the anger builds, right? So understanding, uh, you know, being armed with the knowledge ahead of time helps you just mentally work through that. Um, you know, the yeah. other thing I'll just touch on quickly here, you know, there, there are some insurances that get sold. You know, like, oh, you pay us $30 a month and, you know, your lawyer is on retainer and we'll, uh, 
you know, you hand the card to the police officer when he comes up and we do all the talking for you. Um, haven't really investigated those types of things, but they are out there. Yeah. If you decide to, uh, to buy into something like that, you'd better, you'd better do a lot of research. Do before, some research. Yeah, before you find out what you're buying, right? Uh, See, so I yeah. have lawyers in my family. So I'm, I'm very, very blessed because I have two attorneys on speed dial. Um, you, go, yeah. you know what I mean? And one's, one's a, 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 I shouldn't talk too much about my family, but, uh, you know, one, one does corporate stuff and the other one is, has done, you know, actual criminal, uh, stuff so, for his whole career. So, um, uh, that's the first thing I would do is yeah, the right. second I was in trouble. I know exactly who I'm going to, who I'm going to call and we're family. They're going to be there as soon as they possibly can. And I'm going to shut up and I'm going mm -hmm. to comply with the law enforcement officers the best I can. Now that having been said, um, I do have quite a bit of personal benefit through luck of the draw of circumstances of life. I tend not to be somebody who is a target of uh, law enforcement uh, or any shenanigans that I mean, we've, we've all heard the rhetoric. Um, you know, we all, we all have, have heard all the things that go on. I am, uh, as vanilla a person as you can be. Um, I tend not to be the person who has any trouble with law enforcement. Um, when I do make the occasional mistake, cause I am a human being, of course, you know, I've been pulled over for traffic violations, like, just like the guy next to me. It's never been a problem. I always have real polite conversations with the police officers, uh, in, in question. And I comply wholeheartedly with whatever they tell me because I've never gotten unreasonable, um, I've never been given an unreasonable directive from a law enforcement officer. So I have never had a bad experience with a police officer, even when I was in fact the person in the wrong, um, the person violating the law, all of my experiences with police officers, other than the fact that it, of course you're annoyed because you're in trouble. Let's, let's be honest beyond the fact that I'm being a jerk because I'm mad. I got, caught or whatever beyond that fact all of my experiences with law enforcement officers on a personal level have been very positive i know that's not true for everybody um but that is from my own uh perspective i feel very confident that i can put myself in a position with the average law enforcement officer and i'm going to be okay if you don't feel that way because of your own circumstances i do know plenty of, i have plenty of friends who have been on the opposite side of things with with cops so i know that's a very real thing i'm not saying it, that it isn't um so you you've got to do what's going to be in in your best interest that's that's for sure yeah, uh, reality is certainly not a single-sided thing, right? No, for, for sure, everybody's is, is a little bit different, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. so that, that's true. Um, you you know, one of the other things I'd, I'd kind of like to, to talk about as we're on this is like, and this a student brought this up to me in in class. Uh, this was even before the most recent stuff. You know, we were talking about it towards the end of last year. You know, like, so so you find yourself in the middle of something that's starting up, right? Or let's say you went to work and on your way home is the demonstration route, or you have to walk through it to get to your car, or, you know, you were out, uh, you know, shopping and that's the place everybody decided to gather and start to get angry about whatever it is that they're angry about at the moment, right? What do you do? I'd, what you know, do does you martial do? arts prepare does martial arts prepare you for this at all i i think that that is gonna interestingly i think that's gonna come a lot uh down to the martial arts style you practice uh oddly enough i think that the 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 answer to that is going to have a flavor that is based on the philosophy of the art you take i think that a uh a kempo guy and an aikido guy picked both of those because I don't train either of those just for the record. Um, I think a Kempo guy and an Aikido guy are probably going to look at the situation differently. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and so I think that there's going to be a level of, of coloring of how do I, how do I deal with this that has a lot to do with the overall um, flavor of martial arts style you take. Yeah. I mean, one thing I can say is, um, you know, 
no matter what martial arts style you take, you are not going to like you are not going to suddenly become uh, like Dwayne the Rock Johnson and you know like pick up a baseball bat and just like fight your way through an angry crowd to get to the other side, right? Right. No martial art is going to prepare you for that. It's just it's not it's not going to work, right? Yeah. Um, There's no action stars in real life. Yeah. Right. It just uh, you know if, if life worked the way movies did, we'd all be in a much happier place, but uh, yeah. but it doesn't. So, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we are, um, I would say a path of least resistance type of martial art, at least our primary or Well, I don't know what you consider your primary system, but one of the, the system we train in together is a path of least resistant, uh, right. art type of art. And, right. um, you know, I think there are some things like you can develop tactics just kind of based on that mindset, even if they're not martial arts techniques, right? This is just ways that you learn to think and navigate and stay aware and analyze and decide and respond and all this stuff you can go through all of that well as you're going through this thing right just just to touch on and, and i agree with you very very much so and i was thinking it to myself before you were saying it even so we're we're we're, we're in agreement there and um just as an example of that um path of least resistance you know if you end up in a situation where um, my, I'm at the grocery store and a demonstration starts up in the parking lot and my car is on the far side of it. You know what I'm going to do? Not go to my car because I don't have to. And that there's some things to keep in mind there. This is, this is actually a really good thing to keep in mind in terms of self-defense. And again, I'm not an attorney, but this is fairly, um, fairly common practice uh, across laws is, Although you have a, a right to defend yourself within within limits of specific laws, um, you don't have a right to de defend your property. Okay, and this is a fairly generally accepted thing wherever you go. That yes, you can defend your life, you can defend your person, but not your car. Okay, just so that that we understand that that's generally yeah. in most places considered a no no. Yeah, there are uh, someone is listening is going to comment that that there are places that have what they call the castle doctrine castle law. Mm -hmm. that uh that in most places the castle doctrine applies to your home yep um in some places it applies to it extends to your vehicle no matter where it is yep and in some places it extends to your job and in other places it doesn't even cover your home and this is all within the united states right yep. so yeah that's why you know getting educated on what the laws are where you are is is important yeah uh, yeah, you're not you're not wrong at all. Yeah, but but that having been said, I have full coverage insurance on my vehicle. So regardless of of where the castle doctrine stands within your state, okay, I have full insurance on my vehicle. Do I really need to put myself in a position of defending my car? Is that actually the best decision for me, or am I just kind of inviting trouble that I don't need to invite? Why don't I I just steer clear of the situation and let it dissipate? That would be path least resistance, in my humble opinion. Yeah, I mean, you know, the situation we could come up with a million different scenarios, right? You know, if, if things are getting violent and your best chance for survival, as you calculated, is to get out of there, right? And your car is the best way to do that. And then, you know, sure, you could just we could come up with a million different scenarios, right? But you're you're right. You, you have to think outside of the box, right? Like I came to the grocery store in that car, and I my first intention is I'm going to go home from the grocery store from that car. But you know what? The grocery store probably has a back door and mm -hmm. your home might be pretty far away, but you could walk there. Right. <laughs> right? Uh, and maybe that's what you have to do. And then maybe the next day when things have calmed down, you got to go back, walk back and get your car or call an Uber and, you know, have them take them, take you to your car. Yeah. Um, you know, there's yeah and, this, and really there's all kinds of other variables to, to throw into that equation. What's the difference in the situation between me versus me with my two children, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that changes everything. everything right? That changes everything. There's a big difference between me me having to look at uh, any situation in terms of my own defense and me having to read the situation and think about both of my kids are standing right behind me. That changes everything, and it should. You know, mm -hmm. self-defense is really uh, dealing with variables. And so being able to read the situation for what it is and, and figure out how best to turn those to your advantage. Yeah, I mean, it, it 
you know, having a plan is a valuable thing ahead of time. Like this is the, we should call this the preparedness episode because we keep coming back to that concept, right? Yeah. Be prepared. Um, and, you know, going to the grocery store, we keep using that as an example, is, is an autonomous thing, right? You decide, you know, maybe you're organized enough that you decide ahead of time what you're going to have to for meals that week and you get a list and you go to the grocery store and you know what's in every Man. aisle and you just walk through there and you, you know, you're getting whatever you want. You're throwing it in your cart, you're putting it in bags, you're checking out, you're, you know, you're back to your car and you're home. It's like you barely even think through it. Right. And mm-hmm. you could tell it's that autonomous on that one day, every couple of years you go into the grocery store and they've changed up the aisles and damn Things it, are you moved. pissed? Right. <laughs> Cause I, I am where standing where spaghetti sauce is supposed to be, but there are taco shells here right now. And this is just not the natural order of things. Right. Yeah. Um, so that, yeah. that was that way in a store the other day. I, I don't remember where I was, but I walked into a store and stuff had moved and I was like, where am I? Where is everything? Right. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, that moment. so so think about it. Like these are not things we'd like to have to think about, but maybe we're at, we're in a situation in the country right now where we do have to think about it, right? Um, if where am I going today? It's the grocery store. It's the gas station. It's you know wherever it is you're going. Uh, Walmart. You know whatever. Uh, what am I going to do if, or if I'm going with my wife or I'm going with my kids now, it's what are we going to do if, right? Well, and you, based on that, you never know. Like I said, you never know when something is going to set somebody off. You have no control over what anybody else does. You only really have control over yourself. Mm-hmm. And as a quick example, this is true. Uh, the other night I was going to work um, and I work overnights at one of my jobs And, uh, so it's very routine, uh, as Brian said, you know, kind of autonomous for me to, uh, just go and hit the, uh, gas station and grab a couple of energy drinks before I go to work because I'm going to be there overnight. So I'll get two. I will chug one on my way to work so that I have some level of stimulant going on as soon as I get to work. And then when it hits 3 AM and I'm God awfully tired, Uh, I'll have another one to make sure I can get through the night Um, like that. Not good for me. I know that, but it is kind of how my life is right now. It's kind of the reality of it. So I I was in the gas station and everything is weird with social distancing and masks and put the political environment and people are angry and you, you don't know what's going on. And so a simple situation like uh, who's, whose turn is it to step up to the cash register can turn into a fight. You never know. Mm-hmm. Uh, here, here, here I am in uh, the gas station that I go to. And quite honestly, here's a great example of how you, how you make decisions. I go into the gas station and this gas station is very small and there isn't really room for good social distancing and also a line not a congruent line. So here's the cash register. Here's one small aisle and here's another small aisle. And the cash register is kind of in between the two of them. Here's the one guy. And you could be in this aisle and be in line, or you could be in this aisle and also be in line. And it's kind of confusing. So I am in line and out of the corner of my eye, I see another gentleman in the aisle next to me. And he's shopping for stuff. Me being preemptive I recognize the fact that there might be an issue with this gentleman if he jumps in line there and he doesn't recognize I'm in line over here and there could be a potential situation with some anger, some heat, depending upon how the situation gets reacted to. That's how much I think about this stuff, folks. Mm -hmm. Um, And you may, that may sound paranoid, but having said that, this guy does jump into line on, we're opposite each other, separated by you know, a, a, a thing of like snacks and goodies. And he doesn't realize I've been in line longer than him. The person ahead of me leaves and I step forward and go ahead and do my thing. I am very cognizant of where this guy is just in case there is some kind of uh what did you, what are you doing, man? You cut me off, you know, in case I offended him or made him angry or something like that. I'm, you know, 
aware that that could be a potential thing and i would just stop and go oh hey you know, by the way my response to that would have been oh i'm sorry dude i didn't mean to cut you off go ahead because it's not worth the extra time for me to be like yeah right i was here yeah. first that's the wrong attitude or, that or yeah even uh, even earlier than that you say hey buddy are you in line over there yeah right you know and just who the, cares just the communication starts right yeah I right mean, there's, there's a lot of things you can do that don't involve, you know, your fists or feet to uh, yeah. <laughs> certainly deal but with here, something like here, that. Here's but, yeah. the thing, though. Good example. Uh, you can see how my brain is working, and here's the payoff to my story. I get done with my transaction, and I start to leave the store, and I hear this guy mouth off to the guy who's at the cash register about the fact that I just cut him cut in front of him. Mm. See? So his that was, in fact, his perception but he didn't make a deal of it face to face with me. So there was good reason for me to be thinking that way. And I'm glad it didn't turn into anything in any way, shape or form. He had the presence of mind not to make a deal of it. I had the presence of mind that if he had, I would have just said, listen, man, I apologize. No problem. Cause I didn't want a thing of it either. So I don't think either one of us would have wanted to have a fight, but I still had the presence of mind to go, be aware of where this human being is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I did, I did see, um, uh, I read a, a bit of a, a blog type post. It was a, one of those Facebook or sorry, a YouTube ones, you know, and there was a video attached to it. Uh, it had some good advice for like just things to, um, things to consider if you do get caught in that situation where you had, you know, you're in, you're in the demonstration and you didn't mean to be there or, you know, you have to go through it because you have no other options. You know, what, what are the things that you can do? Um, play along, you know, that, that one of the, the first thing was blend in, right. Yep. Um, play particularly along. for people who work in cities and, you know, I'm relatively near Chicago and right now there's not a lot of people actually going to work there, but you could imagine that. That is a situation with not too many outs, right? Because you have to get to the street and there are a finite number of public transportation places and a finite number of parking lots and you don't, you know, you don't have as many options, right? Um, you know, if you're the kind of, like a good piece of advice that they gave was if you're the kind of person who wears a suit to work um, and you feel like there could be, you know, unrest on your way home, bring a change of clothes. When you leave the office, put on jeans and a shirt, you know, regular jeans and a sweatshirt. Just look like a regular person, right? Because um, people people are tribal, like we talked about before, and uh, they will look for the thing that is different and single out, single it out, right? So try not to look like the thing that is different. If it um, if it just so happened that if because I always look like a regular person, I don't have any type of work where I dress. Uh, I basically wear the same crap all the time, sweatshirts and sweatpants mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. If, but, but to, to go along with your analogy, if I was walking and suddenly a crowd, a, a MAGA crowd grew around me, okay, if it suddenly grew around me, I guarantee you while I was moving through the crowd, I would be, uh, oh, Trump, yeah. make America great. Absolutely. For the, you or know, Biden so, or whatever. Right. Yes. The part, right. <laughs> I, exactly. I can definitely, when there are 500 people around me and I don't want trouble, I can definitely make that ability to blend in. And then when I'm safe, I don't have to blend in anymore. Okay. But what is the point of being, uh, an island in the storm, right? Yeah, what is exactly. A, you know, I, I don't want any trouble as a general rule. If there's 500 people surrounding me that are uh, all in, in one particular mindset that I don't occupy, my, my life won't change their mind. It won't. No, you're right, yeah. It won't. My mind won't change my mind. And maybe I can have a rational conversation with one of those people but I can't with 500 of them. Right. Right. So if I really feel strongly about my political ideals and things like that, I'll, I'd be happy if one of those individuals sat down for me uh, with me for coffee, we could talk. That's fine. But 500 of them, there's no winning that. Yeah, you're right. Um, you know, blend in, act the part, uh, you, you know, 
choose your battles is kind of a way to say what you're just saying there, right? Like mm-hmm. you could be, again, you could be really mad and like, you know, and really disagree with whatever it is that they're, that they're talking about, but that is not the battlefield, right? That you want to choose um, to, to put it, you know, in those terms, right? You, uh, you, you aren't going to get anywhere. Um, you know, the other thing is like, stay, you know, like I could think, we we have a square in our town, right? There's an old courthouse, which is now basically just a, a wedding venue and then a bunch of uh, artisan type shops. But people, there have been some gatherings there, right? And, uh, you know, there's a couple ways to get out of that place to the other. One is through the middle and the other is go two blocks, two blocks, two blocks, right? Um, so stay to the outside, the right? Yeah, uh, it is another good thing. Um yeah, and play the part is absolutely true. Like, you know, whatever it is, just, uh, you know, it doesn't mean you have to participate in anything that's illegal, right? But right. Uh, if someone looks at you and yells, you know, whatever they're going to yell and go you right say, on, you buddy. say, oh, oh, no, thank you, you know, um, then guess what? You are now the subject of their ire, right? And just, if you just say, go, absolutely, yeah. brother, I totally agree with you, you know screw the Packers or whatever, you know, whatever the topic of the moment is. Um, or just go, yeah. Yeah, right. Exactly. You know, uh, certainly, certainly uh, can get you through long enough to get out of the situation and a very important thing to do. I mean, I got no problem with standing up for what you believe is right. I'm actually a really big uh, proponent of that, but I also understand that I can't fight a mob. Um, you know what I mean? And I'm yeah. and I'm somebody yeah. who has been been dumb enough to stand up to a small group of people like that before and get the crap beat out of me. So um, when I was a child. <laughs> not, yeah, well, not, I mean, right. Not, and, you know, schoolyard stuff. Schoolyard stuff is what I'm talking about here. But, um, you know, when when there's 100 angry people, the only thing that's going to happen is they're going to stomp, stomp you into the ground um, and you're going to have your voice shouted down. That nothing good will come of it for you. Uh, or your agenda, regardless of what it is. So you kind of got to let that stuff go until you have the opportunity to to voice it in a place where you actually can make a difference. Absolutely. Yeah. Live to fight another day, right? Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Very good point there. What's what's the little girl's name? Greta. uh, What's her last name? Thunberg? something like that uh, yes that's the yeah. environmental activist yeah. yeah yeah right she's she's a little kid who has had the world stage to be able to to air her views on things regardless of how you may feel about her views she has been able to stand up in literally in front of the world and say how dare you right um if that little kid did that in a in, in a group of of angry people she would get lynched right. um right there's a time and a place and I'm, I'm not saying that there isn't a good reason to put her up so she can talk about about her political ideology and all that what all i'm saying is that there's there are places where you can wag a finger um and and speak like that and be heard and there are places when you do it and the only thing that happens is you get thrown to the ground and curb stomped is what i'm trying to get at. yeah true and if you look back uh you know if you're the type of person that really has the passion to make a big change in the world that's that's great you know you, you should you should follow that but look back at the great leaders of of any time really, but particularly modern times, right? Uh, you know, in the U.S., and they they did not build their influence at rallies and and demonstrations, right? The all of the influence had been built in other ways: letters to the editor at the newspaper, uh, articles published here and there, interviews on TV, you know, all of that kind of stuff, and people gathered in public places to hear those people speak because they already had their had influenced those people. Right. If, uh, if the if, rally came later. Right. Exactly. If uh, Greta Thunberg or, uh, you know, Martin Luther King or anybody else, you know, just decided to get up on a pulpit in front of a crowd of angry people and tried to, even with all their great natural influencing ability, uh, make a difference there, it would not have worked because Mob mentality is a real thing. People are not thinking 
like people at that point mm-hmm. in time. They're thinking like a mob and it's, yeah. uh, it's different and well-documented phenomenon. Yes, it is. So. Absolutely. Lowest common denominator thinking. Right. That's right. It's, and, and, you know, everybody, everybody's done it. So you deal with it with your kids, right? It's like, uh, you know, your kids, um, you know, maybe you don't let your kids have uh, pop, uh, you know, or soda or whatever you call it uh, after, you know, after dinner or whatever. Right. And they go to a friend's house and you go and pick them up at eight o'clock at night. And what are they doing? They're, <laughs> they're drinking a pop. Right. Why? Because the other kid and the other kid and the other kid and the other kid are all doing it. Yep. Right. Yep. So it, it's, it's that same psychological mentality. It's like, well, everybody around me is doing it and maybe I should be doing it too. Um, or maybe I can get away with it because even if I feel like it, even if the me alone that, feels like it's wrong, since everybody else is doing it, maybe I can get away with it too, right? That is a, is uh, a real key to it, what you said right there. There's the the mob, mob mentality leads to mob justification. That's what it leads to. So, well, everybody else is, so it's okay if I do because everybody else is doing it. And that's what it leads to. Is it, it, it gives you a moral justification. It gives you carte blanche to do something like that. And that's absolutely. That's what it really kind of comes back to. So, you know... Um, the, the biggest thing to kind of keep in mind as we, as we go on here is, um, you can train technique, you can train all that kind of stuff. Um, but you should understand that the, the things that you're going to learn in a martial arts school are going to be the most useful to you, regardless of what the political environment is, is going to be a lot of the mental stuff and a lot of the emotional Absolutely. stuff, controlling your feelings, as Brian said, being able to, to be aware of, of, of fear and anger and being able to control those um, and having a, a mindset of forward thinking of what this situation can be is probably what the martial arts is going to give you most. Um, and hopefully you also have instructors that are knowledgeable enough to tell you, Hey, go read the law. Um, and if your instructors haven't given you that, that knowledge, well, then you heard it here from Brian and I, and it, if you haven't heard it from your instructor, maybe nobody ever presented <laughs> it to them. Yes. Okay. That's a, that's a possibility. It's very possible that their teacher didn't he didn't think to say that to them and they just haven't had that thought. That's okay. Um, go, go take a look at the law and understand that martial arts are not whatever, you know, you've got a responsibility. Absolutely. Yes. I can go out on a legal limb and say the, uh, strike first, strike hard, no mercy, no mercy. <laughs> uh, advice that you may be getting at your martial arts school is not sound legal advice. Uh, but yeah, you're absolutely right. So this is this, I think if we're just going to kind of sum this up, we're going to say, you know, in times like these, this this is a great example of how your martial arts training as a way of life is is coming to fruition here, right? Um, you know, you stepped into a martial arts school looking for self-defense. Whether you realized it or not, you were choosing to become prepared. Or maybe mm-hmm. you'd been beaten up in the past, or maybe you never even worried about being beaten up. You just wanted to learn or maybe you're worried about getting beat up in the future or whatever, and, and you stepped in and you decided to be prepared. I'm going to gain some knowledge so the next time I have more options. Um, the same thing is happening here. You're gained, you, you gained the ability to improve your awareness, to make that a lifestyle, to go through that, evaluate, decide, react, process all the time. Um, and then, again, the other thing I will say is just please, um, you know, spend some time on thinking about it ahead, right? Make those plans. When you go out, what are your backup plans going to be? If something happens, where am I going to go? What am I going to do? Who am I going to call? All that kind of stuff. And from a, from a philosophical standpoint, let me just leave you with this. When it comes to all the civil unrest and everything that is going on, regardless of your political affiliation, take a step back for a second. And I want you to keep in mind the old adage of seek first to understand and then to be understood. If you and I and everybody around us, if we can take a moment to, to back off of the idea that, Hey, I'm right. Um, long enough to listen to someone else's point of view. Um, you can help to deescalate a lot of the problems that are going on because a lot of the problems that are going on are simple, simple as the fact that people feel unheard. Okay. So hear them, take a second, hear them, listen, um, 
as opposed to give, having an automatic gain, uh, uh, gainsay to what it is that they have to say, right? Take a second just to, to quiet your mind and, and just listen to what they have to say and actively listen. You Absolutely. might make a difference there. Another good uh, homework assignment for everybody. Think about the person that you like the least, right? Maybe it's somebody at work who drives you nuts or what? Just pick someone and think of one thing you have in common with that person. Just one thing. Doesn't matter how big or small. And uh, you'll you'll be surprised that you 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 if you can't find one, you're not trying. <laughs> right. Mm, mm. Well put. Anyhow, yeah. Anyhow. Um, Dan, I think next week we should lighten it up a little bit. What do you think? Yeah, I'd really like that. This is pretty heavy and more serious than I like usually. <laughs> so I say uh, we bring our top five uh, favorite martial arts movies. Uh, I've discuss. already got a list in my head <laughs> brewing. It will be difficult to get down to five. I think. That's the but, problem. Yeah. That's the problem. So, yeah, it'll be, it'll be very interesting. I actually, I'm not going to spoil it. Uh, I have an indie film to share. Uh, our producer Tamron knows it, um, and it'll be one that very few people are aware of because it is an independent film. It's not done by a big budget studio or anything, but it is freaking awesome for anybody who enjoys the traditional martial arts. Um, it's absolutely amazing to watch in terms of how it's put together and it's a great story and, um, maybe you'll want to go check it out after you listen to the podcast. Sounds, sounds interesting. I'm, I'm yeah. excited to hear what it is. So I'll, yeah. I'll have to make sure I tune, tune in next week. Uh, all cool. right. Well, thanks again, everyone for listening, um, watching, uh, however you're enjoying this. We appreciate it. Please uh, like, subscribe, share, help us get our, uh, you know, our name out there. The more people that see us, um, you know, the more people we reach and eventually the more things we can do with this channel. So we need your help with that and we appreciate it. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good night and uh, go out there and be good to each other, folks. Be kind.